papá para ver matar si trabajo. En esto. Ah. Uh, Dr. Mati Rao, we are now live on the YouTube. Can we start the meeting? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good uh, morning to everyone. Uh, Professor Indumati Rao, Professor Siena Rao, and all other colleagues who have joined for this special occasion. It's indeed a special privilege for us that Amit Trust today celebrating the National Science Day is uh, Dr. Indumati Rao from Education Technology Unit of uh, JNCSR. And we are doubly blessed and especially blessed with the presence of uh, Professor Siena Rao, who has also spared his valuable time to join us on the occasion. It is a great uh, privilege for us to see them both, even though we are not able to meet them in person. Uh, Dr. Indumati Rao has been carrying out human service to the country by spearheading popular science communication activities for the benefit of young students. She, I will give a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Indumati Rao for the benefit of the young students from various schools and uh, uh, our own young students who joined from different sites. Uh, Dr. Indumati Rao received her bachelor's degree in English literature from Mysore University. Master's degree in sociology from University of Kanpur, education from Pandi University, and certificate in education from Oxford University. She started her teacher teaching career in 1968 at the Opportunity School and IDA Kanpur for educationally and socially disadvantaged children. After a teaching career spanning nearly three decades, she retired as a reader in education at MES Teachers College affiliated to Bangalore University. Uh, Mrs. Rao joined the Education Technology Unit at the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in 1996 as the, honor, uh, the honorary coordinator of the multimedia group. And this group has done fantastic work in terms of science communication. It has brought out uh, syllabi-based educational CD-ROMs uh, titled Understanding Chemistry, Learning Science, etc. And uh, Mrs. Rao herself has translated several books into Canada including the book Understanding Chemistry and the book titled Nano World. Dr. Rao has co-authored several popular books such as Lives and Times of Great Pioneers in Chemistry. And very recently, she also co-authored a book with Professor Siena Rao titled Founders of Modern Science in India, a great source of inspiration for the young scientists to read this book. This book was published by the Indian Academy of Sciences. And in the preface of the book, the authors themselves highlighted how they have effectively used the pandemic situation to give necessary, to get the necessary free time and uh, take up this important activity of science communication. Mrs. Rao is committed to science outreach programs, particularly to create interest in science as career and also to develop scientific temper. Towards this end, Professor Siena Rao and Mrs. Rao have conducted very large number of science population programs for school children and teachers and in collaboration with many institutes across the country. And uh, Mrs. Rao has received several honors and recognitions and she is also an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. The Academy website, if any of us see, it says, it says in its citation that Dr. Rao was honored for devoting all her life in the field of education and scientifically contributing to develop new methods of teaching and teaching aids to school children. I think we are greatly blessed that we have an eminent, such an eminent personality today amidst us, and that too to talk of Faraday. And I'm sure all the young students who listen to this lecture will be you know, greatly inspired by listening to her. We recall very, very fondly that uh, uh, Dr. Mrs. Rao gave a scintillating lecture on Mendeleev during the event held by HBNI to commemorate the International Year of the Periodic Table in 2019. And we all keenly look forward to another occasion to receive both Professor Rao and Mrs. Rao at HBNI so that our students can continue to get their blessings and continue to get the inspiration. I'm sure that today as well, Mrs. Rao would enthrall all of us
through her research on one of the most illustrious scientists of all time, Michael Faraday. And without taking any more of your time, I request uh, Dr. Mrs. Rao to start her lecture. Professor Vasudeva Rao, Vice Chancellor of HBNI, members of the Academic Council, and Professor Tyagi. It is indeed a great honor to be the chief guest on National Science Day and address the audience and the gathering there at HBNI. I am going to talk about the incredible story of the journey of Michael Faraday from a boy with minimal formal education of just three years to the greatest scientist of all time and a quintessential human being. This story is like a fairy tale, a kind of a Cinderella story with Humphrey Davy being the godfather. Now, you will see on the screen a candle. In fact, I must say, Professor Vasudeva Rao has taken a lot of time from this. So the candle time, I must apologize, will not be the same. According to Faraday, he always lit a candle, a standard size candle when he started his lecture. And it would die out at the end of exactly one hour. I would have done it in person had I had, it die, had an in-person meeting. Instead, I would use this. I'll quote Faraday here. I disapprove of long lectures. One hour is long enough for anyone, nor should they be allowed to exceed the time. This slide is to remind me when the time is up. Thank you. This extraordinary journey of Faraday straddles two distinct phases. The first 14 years of strife of a difficult childhood when he had to deal with disadvantages of poverty, serious speech impediment. He could not pronounce R, he would say W. Instead of Robert, his brother's name, he would call him Robert. This resulted in the next disadvantage, lack of education because whenever he called his brother, it would cause merriment in the class, but it would annoy the teacher who was convinced that Faraday was doing it on purpose and it would result in long corporal punishment, day after day, day after day. So at the end of three years of this, his mother took him out of school. So that resulted in lack of disadvantage of lack of education. And finally, lack of class belonging, not, not belonging to the upper echelons of society in a class conscious England of the 18th century. The second phase, fortunately, life began to change. Once he attained 14 years, he had to become a, an apprentice. He chose the trade of a bookbinder and he became a bookbinder under one Mr. Rebo, is a kind-hearted bookshop owner and bookbinder for the next seven years. He overcame all his 
his advantages by including speech impediment, mind you, by sheer determination, grit, and doggedness, by educating himself and becoming the greatest experimental scientist and a fearless communicator of all times. Michael Faraday was born on 22nd September 1791 in Newington Butts, a poor district in South London, in an impoverished family. His father, James Faraday, was a gentleman blacksmith, that is, belonging to the lowest rank of trade. And his mother came from a poor farming family. Her most unenviable task was the responsibility to feed and provide basic needs for her family. However, they were deeply religious. They belonged to San Dominion sect an obscure sect of Christianity. The basic tenet of this sect was to shun all materialistic possessions, lead a life of unquestioning acceptance of thy will be done and their lot, shaped Faraday's character and science. Faraday's lived in, a, in two rooms above a coach house. Michael Faraday and his brother went to a common day school where they learned the basic triage. As I mentioned earlier, even this schooling ended abruptly after just three years as Michael's speech impediment was a source of daily corporal punishment. His mother decided enough was enough and took the children out of school. Things changed when he turned 13. He took up the he, a job of an errand boy with Mr. Rebo, the kind-hearted bookshop owner. A year later, when he turned 14, he had, when he had to choose a trade, and become an apprentice, he decided to become a bookbinder under Rebo. This choice proved to be a life-changing one. Faraday, from becoming perhaps the greatest bookbinder, became the greatest scientist, experimental scientist, and a quintessential human being. Faraday soon became a bookbinder, but he did not bind the books blindly or mechanically. He avidly read the books that he bound, especially the science books that came for binding. He was greatly influenced by Encyclopedia Britannica, Jane Marsh's Conversations on Chemistry, the article on electricity in Encyclopedia Britannica triggered his lifelong interest in electricity. And Jane Marset's book, Conversations on Chemistry, introduced him to the world, exciting world of experimental science. Faraday's passion for experimental verification of concepts in chemistry and physics were kindled by his work, by this book. Using discarded bottles and wood pieces, he built a crude electrostatic machine and conducted simple experiments in chemistry. He built a working voltaic pipe by stacking seven halfpenny coins, covering it with seven zinc discs, and placing six papers moisture with salt solution in between them. Using this device as a source of electricity, he decomposed magnesium sulfate, his first chemistry experiment. 
Isaac Roth's improvement of the mind made Faraday realize the need to improve his knowledge base. He kept a record of the books he read, of the books he intended to read, of the experiments he conducted and intended to conduct in a, as a record. And he called this record philosophical miscellany. In those days, chemistry as a subject or a word did not exist. Mr. Rebo was impressed by his protégé's binding skills as well as his motivation to educate himself. 1980, sorry, 1812, the defining year that changed Faraday's life. Faraday became a scientist by accident. His apprenticeship had ended and he had started practicing his trade as a budding bookbinder. However, a chance encounter with Mr. Dance, a rich client of Rebo, changed Faraday's life. Mr. Dance was told by Rebo of Faraday's interest in science. Mr. Dance immediately gave Faraday four tickets for Humphrey Davies' last four lectures at Royal, Insti Royal Institution on philosophy, philosophical, the, the chemical philosophy, sorry, chemical philosophy. Faraday attended all the four lectures. He entered RI, Royal Institution, for the first time on 29th February, 1812. He was spellbound by Humphrey Davies' oratory and flair for doing experiments. Davies' lectures convinced Faraday that his career should be in the service of science. He took meticulous notes of the lectures, bound them into a book, and presenting to Davy, asked him for a job any job in his lab. Davy politely refused it, saying he had no openings, but also with an advice, quote, science is a harsh mistress, and in a pecuniary point of view, poorly rewarding those who devote themselves to her service. In other words, continue being a bookbinder and make more money Science is not for making money. True, even today. Any, any job is better, it seems. Again, another accident took, accidental event took place. Faraday had not lost hope. He, was, he knew something would turn up. A few months later, Mr. Payne, Davy's lab assistant, lost his job because he misbehaved in the Royal Institution laboratory. Humphrey Davy remembered Faraday and he recommended Faraday to Royal Institution to hire him. Royal Institution agreed and offered the job as a bottle washer to Faraday at one guinea per week, much less than what he was earning as a novice bookbinder. And with free accommodation of two rooms at the top of Royal Institution, Faraday was overjoyed. He had no hesitation in accepting the job. Faraday joined the Royal Institution on March 1st, 1813. The two rooms at the top of the Royal Institution remained his home for the next 51 years. His association with Royal Institution ended only with his death in 1867. As a bottle washer, 
Faraday was required to assist the lecturer by keeping the apparatus or instrument required for and re re required for the experiment clean and store them carefully in the repository after the lecture and demonstration. Maintain a log of the breakage of any instrument, as well as those requiring repairs and report the same to the manager in charge of the repository. Dust and clean the borders once a week and all the instrument in glass cases at least once a month. Faraday was a quick learner. Watching Davy conduct experiments, he started doing them himself in a laboratory he had set up in the basement of his flat at the Royal Institution. Soon there was yet another unexpected turn in his life. It was as if fate had decided Faraday should become a scientist. Humphrey Davy decided to go on a lecture tour to Europe as Europe was the epicenter of scientific research and asked Faraday to accompany him as valet come bottle washer as his regular valet refused to go to the continent. They started the journey from London to Southampton on 13th October, 1830. Faraday's entry in his book, Wednesday, October 13th, 1813, this morning formed an epoch in my life. It was a completely life-changing experience. He, Faraday, who had not gone beyond 12 miles out of London, a whole new world opened up. The picture, picturesque journey through the countryside caused a revolution in his ideas about the nature of the Earth's surface. He was convinced that the laws of nature governed what happened on earth and nothing was too wonderful to be consistent with laws of nature. Davy's reputation as an experimentalist had preceded him and opened doors to laboratories all across Europe. Faraday impressed them by his meticulous work and work ethics. He made lifelong friends with most of them. Ampere's work on electricity and Oersted's work on magnetism had great impact on Faraday. In those days, when there was minimal contact between the scientists of England and France, Faraday, by his work ethics and behavior and facility to conduct experiments won many friends in the French Academy. Faraday left Europe in 1813 as Davis dishwasher, but returned to RI in 1815 after 18 months as an accomplished experimental scientist. Europe was his university. The laboratories he visited and worked in were his classrooms and the leading scientists, his professors. Faraday spent the next few years honing his experimental skills and public speaking to popularize scientific knowledge among lay public and children. 1821 was a turning point both in his personal and professional life. He married Sarah, a fellow Sandemanian. She was his greatest support throughout the rest of his life. Professionally, in the next 16 years, sorry, in the next 28 years, he produced a volume of scientific output that had never been witnessed before and what perhaps will never be witnessed again. Faraday had a holistic view of chemistry. During this period, he made major contributions to chemistry, physics, electricity, so much so all three of them claimed Faraday to be their own. Faraday had what is known as chemical intuition, the special quality chemist claim that helps them to leapfrog from an idea to conclusions by experiments. 
his phenomenal contribution to chemistry included preparation of alloy steel, liquefaction of chlorine gas, discovery of benzene, he called, which he called bicarbonate of hydrogen, production of optical glass, synthesized compounds of chlorine and carbon for the first time, determined chlorine hydrates composition, conducted heterogeneous catalysis, and so on. List is too long. And made significant contributions to organic chemistry. In physics, he conducted experiments in electromagnetic conduction. So induction. In 1821, he had shown conversion of mechanical energy to motion. In, a, in 1831, he showed conversion of mechanical energy to electrical energy. Faraday's research in electricity is mind-boggling. He discovered that electricity was a force of nature, and it was the same no matter how it was produced, whether it was a lightning or whether it was uh, through any other source, it was just, it was always the same. And it flowed from particle to particle in a conductor. And most importantly, human mind was above it, not below. Between 1832 and 1834, he conducted experiments in electrochemistry. He presented two papers describing experiments in electricity formulating the laws governing evolution of electricity by magnetoelectric induction. He enunciated laws of electrolysis. Even today, it amazes scientists how he could have formulated the law when the atoms were unknown and electrons were unknown. This was a leap of belief. He discovered the relationship between electricity and chemistry. Uh, that the salt deposited was directly proportional to the quantity of the current passing through it. With his friend William Wavell, help, he invented the nomenclature such as electrode, anode, cathode, ion, magnetism, paramagnetism terms that are used even today. He studied electri static electricity and proved its property by ice pile experiment. He conceptualized the experiments, devised simple apparatus to prove the fundamental principles. Experiments to prove oxygen was paramagnetic, electromagnetic rotation, electromagnetic induction, ice pile experiment are classic examples of this. Experiment to prove oxygen was paramagnetic, pa paramagnetic was, was e extremely simple. Faraday made soap bubbles in two beakers, passed oxygen through one and new nitrogen through the other. He blew the soap bubbles through a magnetic field. Soap bubbles containing oxygen moved towards the magnet and soap bubbles containing nitrogen went through without any deviation. His experiment on electromagnetic rotation was equally simple. Faraday fixed a magnet at the bottom of a deep basin in such a way that only one of the poles was above the surface. He then filled it with mercury. A freely moving wire was suspended above the bowl and dipped into mercury. An electric current was passed through the wire. It rotated around the fixed magnet. Next, he fixed the wire and the magnet was free to move when the current was passed through the wire. The magnet rotated around the wire. This relentless quest for fundamental principles affected his health and in 1839, he was medically advised to desist from all high pressure mental activity. He could resume research activity only in 1845.
But now it was at a completely different level. He wanted to find experimental proof for his long held belief that all forces of nature had a common origin. He concentrated his research on finding proof for this belief. His religious belief in the all powerful creator found no conflict in thinking that origin of magnetism, electricity, and all other forces were the same. Again, his experimental setup was very simple. He passed a plane of polarized beam of light through the special optical glass he had prepared in 1821. And when he switched on the electromagnet, whose lines of force were parallel to the light rays, he observed that even when the direction of the ray of light was changed, the rotation remained in the same direction. He concluded correctly, the rotation was solely due to the polarity of the magnetic line support. The role of optical glass was only to detect this change in direction. Faraday had a inkling that almost all materials, irrespective of the state of matter, would respond to the magnetic field one way or the other. He, pa he passed a number of uh, solids like bismuth, iron, nickel, and gases like oxygen and nitrogen, and aqueous solutions through a magnetic field. And he found that some of them were attracted to the uh, magnet magnetic field very strongly, and some did not respond at all, and some responded very weakly. He called those that were attracted very strongly to the strong part of the magnetic field paramagnetic, and those that did not, he called them diamagnetic. Oxygen, for example, was attracted slightly towards the magnetic field, while nitrogen was not, as the earlier experiment on proving oxygen as a paramagnetic showed. Faraday's work and Faraday's work and magnetization of light, illumination of lines of force were futuristic. As Peter Zeeman, Nobel laureate, put it, quote, they appear to us to be almost prophecies because we have now seen that light can in fact be magnetized and in nature itself, in the Northern Lights, an example of illumination of magnetic lines of force of Earth by electrons escaping the sun, Aurora Borealis. And he also showed transmission of light through solutions, mag electromagnetic induction, diamagnetism, lines of force. These fundamental discoveries paved the way for Maxwell's field theory and unification of forces. Maxwell, Maxwell said, Faraday is and must always remain the father of the science of electromagnetism. In a Beckerian lecture titled Experimental Relations of Gold and Other Metals to Light that Faraday gave in 1857, he said that when gold was reduced in exceedingly small fine particles, which becoming diffused, produced beautiful fluids of different preparations of gold, whether ruby, green, white, green, violet, or blue, all consist of gold in a metallic divided state, and their properties were different from the those of bulk gold. He called this divided metals. He recognized the relationship between size of particles and change of color. The relation between quantum size and properties of nanoparticles was observed for the first time. The original samples are kept in Royal Institution even now. Faraday's work ethics are very interesting. He believed that five essential skills for success were concentration, discrimination, 
organization, innovation, and communication. But without the discipline to work, finish, and publish, they amounted to nothing. Faraday worked alone in his laboratory. He had no grants, government grants or private uh, grants, private endowments. He had no students, he had no postdocs, and he had no laptop. His mind was everything. He worked alone, with a, sometimes with a lab assistant, and he confessed that he would, they would work for days without speaking to each other. They would concentrate so much on the work at hand. He kept metic a meticulous record of the work done daily in the laboratory. <coughs> His notebook of December 1833 had entries for 24th December and 26th December. There was no entry for 25th for obvious reasons. Faraday had definite views on accepting honors. He felt, quote, I have always felt that there is something degrading in offering rewards for intellectual exertions. This is one of the features of modern day when people get rewarded, state rewards and other rewards for their intellectual activities. According to him, the pursuit of science was the best reward. And he refused to accept honors that had nothing to do with his intellectual work. He did not accept Victoria's offer of knighthood. His reason is very, very interesting. He wrote to her, thanking her for the honor she wanted to bestow, and said, Madam, I am known to my friends as Michael Faraday. If I accept the knighthood, I will become Sir Michael, and I will feel very far away from my friends. So please excuse me. Similarly, he did not want to be buried in Westminster Abbey, a place where all the royalty of England and distinguished persons who had contributed to the glory of England are buried. You can see Newton's, Newton is buried there and you can see Newton's tomb there. He refused the presidency of Royal Society twice, not once, but twice. And he wrote to his friend Tyndall, I do not want to accept this honor because I cannot guarantee to myself my intellectual integrity. I will be corrupted. Look at his sense of value. He refused all such honors and he accepted only academic honors. The Royal Society London awarded him the Royal Medal twice. In chemistry in 1934, physics in 1846, and the Copley Medal, chemistry in 1832, physics in 1838. Perhaps the only scientist to be thus rewarded in two separate physical sciences disciplines, twice. He also accepted Remford Medal of the Royal Society, lifetime Fullerian professorship. He was elected to the Royal Society in 1824, foreign member to Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in 1838, French Academy in 1844, received the honoris causa from Oxford University in 1832, and from Cambridge University in 1862. In 1826, Faraday introduced evening discourse and Christmas lectures for children to bring science to common public. The lectures, the evening le lectures were meant to amuse, entertain, as well as educate. 
Faraday was a brilliant and fearless communicator. I dis he said, I disapprove of the long lecture. One hour is long enough for anyone, nor should they be allowed to exceed that time. Please note that. And I must tell myself not to exceed. He gave six inspiring Christmas lectures titled a Chemical History of a Candle in December 1861. They were later published as a book. In the introduction, he said, he selected the topic as it illustrated every physical and chemical law. And in the concluding sixth lecture, it's so beautiful. I think this is the message every teacher should give the student. He said, quote, I express a wish that you may, in your generation, be fit to be compared to a candle, that you may like it, shine as lights those to those about you, that in all your actions, you may justify the beauty of the tap, taper by making your deeds honorable and effectual in charge of your dis, discharge of your duty to your fellow men. Faraday was a compassionate and generous man. He was an equally unique person. He did not bear any grudge towards even those who had harmed him simply. When somebody reminded him that Humphrey Davy had blocked his election to the Royal Society, he snubbed him and said, I remember only nothing but Davy's kindness to me, and added that Sir Humphrey Davy would do what he thought was best for the Royal Society. He was a good environmentalist. Once, it is a very nice story, once he took a boat ride down the River Thames in 1855. He was appalled by the state of the stinking river. On getting off the boat, he rushed to a news, leading newspaper and said, the river which flows for so many miles through London ought not to be allowed to become a fermenting sewer. Punch, that magazine, published a cartoon in which Faraday is seen giving a card, a card to Father Thames saying, we hope this dirty fellow will consult the learned professor. Faraday had a wry sense of humor. Gladstone, the Prime Minister of England went to see Faraday in the lab and seeing his experiment and experiment, uh, electricity, he said, but after all, Professor, what is the use of it? Faraday, with a deadpan expression, said, why, sir, there is every probability that you will soon be able to tax it. We are paying the tax even today. And, and at another time, Looking at another experiment, he said, what use is this experiment, Mr. Faraday? Faraday said, sir, what is the use of a newborn baby? In 1861, while giving a lecture, Faraday suffered a momentary loss of memory. He could not recall what he was talking about, and he could not draw on the immense knowledge he had, and he did not want to disappoint his audience. More than anything else, he was afraid this would become more and more frequent, and he would be an embarrassment for royal institution. He decided to leave royal institution, as he did not want to become an embarrassment. He left his home with, in, at RI, along with his wife, Sarah, for the last time in 1864 and retired to his home at Hampton Court. He died peacefully on August 25th, 1865, with his wife, Sarah, beside him. Such was this extraordinary human being. Extraordinary tributes were paid by scientists, writers, 
politicians and even ordinary people then and that continue to be paid even more than 175 years after it is dead. It emphasizes the uniqueness of Michael Faraday. This is the memorial at New Newington Buds that they have created for Michael Faraday. Aldous Huxley, the great, one of the greatest literary figures of England, he said, even if I could be Shakespeare, I think I should still choose to be Faraday. He, through all this, Faraday remained a very humble person. According to L.P. Williams, one of his biographers, quote, his true humility lay in his profound consciousness of his debt to his creator. Similarly, Henry Bell Jones felt, quote, that a poor, uneducated son of a journeyman blacksmith and a country maid was permitted to glimpse the beauty of the eternal loss of nature was a never-ending source of wonder to him. The Times published an ob obituary on Wednesday, 28th August, 1867, on page 7, obituary column. The late Professor Faraday. I'll read this. It's so beautiful. It sums up Faraday, the man Faraday, the scientist, both of them so unique that we will perhaps never see such a person again. The world of science lost on Sunday one of its most assiduous and enthusiastic members. The life of Michael Faraday had been spent in the single pursuit of scientific discovery as a man of science. He was gifted with the facility of experimenting. He was one of those men who have become distinguished despite every disadvantage of origin and lack of early education. He had the true spirit of a philosopher. The cause of science would meet with fewer enemies. Mind you, this is very important. The cause of science would meet with fewer enemies its discoveries would command a more ready ascent were all its votaries imbued with the humility of Michael Faraday. Unquote. Einstein, on Gandhiji's 70th birthday, paid this tribute. Generations to come, it may well be, will scarce believe that a, such a man as this one, ever in flesh and blood, walked upon this world, is equally true of Faraday. Thank you. Finish. I think. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Rao, for the fascinating presentation. And you, we are not seeing the passage of time. It's, it's been 50 minutes, but you took us through more than 50 years of life of a great scientist. And uh, I wanted to mention that you mentioned about Faraday, single pursuit of scientific discovery. We here, we all know, you have had a single pursuit of communicating science to children and young students. One can easily see from this lecture how that is so effective and why students and the researchers love to hear you. Thank Your you. presentation was uh, so fluid and so smooth and the simplicity of the language you used at the same time with in-depth coverage and dealing with the science as well as the scientist, not only talking about his contributions, but also talking about his qualities. I think all this made a very wonderful lecture that we will remember for a very, very long time. Uh, if you agree, you could uh, handle a few questions from the audience. Uh, 
Uh, a few. One yes. or two. One or two. Yes. Dr. Jani, would like to make any remarks or any any queries to her? You can speak. Madam, uh, uh, Madam, only one question I have for you and uh, respected Rao sir also. When India will get its Michael Faraday? <laughs> Never. I, it's impossible. He is a perfect man. Look at him as a scientist, as an experimental scientist, a man who had no training, nothing. He, uh, as I mentioned, laboratories were his classroom. Scientists are his professors. He learned on the job. It is like throwing somebody into the deep end of a swimming pool. You learn. And more than that, he remained true to himself, a role model of a quintessential human being, how we should all be irrespective of how famous we become, how much we contribute. Humility is the virtue. I, I don't think there can be any, any, anybody like Faraday again. In natural, nearly 200 years, there hasn't been. And it's unlikely that what uh, Einstein said about Gandhiji, I truly believe applies to Faraday. Uh, thank you, madam. I think you know, after this lecture, questioning is a little... Uh, yes. It, it will take away the spirit, but I'm prepared to answer. But one or two only. I will be violating I... Faraday's dictum. Don't help you go more yes. than that now. Yes, yes. That's, that's true. And... Uh, uh, I also I also find that the audience is so mesmerized and they are yet to come out of the spell. I don't think there will be many questions. Uh, if you if you agree, I want to ask a question which will digress from the lecture today. But we want to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, being the National Science Day, naturally we also have to remember Professor Sir C. V. Raman, who, uh, who celebrate whose uh, achievements we are celebrating today, and he was closely. No, he was the first Indian director of the Indian Institute of Science, and you have also been associated with the Indian Institute of Science for a long time. What will be uh, your thoughts about Professor C. V. Raman? You know, uh, Professor, uh, uh, my husband, has wonderful recollection of uh, Sir C. V. Raman from professional, how he was the first one to uh, give him the encouragement by asking him to become the member of this academy. My recollection of Sir C. V. Raman was what a kind man he was. You know, once uh, in Bangalore Brigade Road, it was kind of a chilly November. My husband and myself were going down the road, and there was Sir C. V. Raman in, you know, almost suddenly in front of us. And he said, young lady, you should wear a shawl or a sweater. You will catch a cold, you know, <laughs> a Nobel laureate, a, you know, an accomplished scientist. Who will think about a young person going around with a sweater or a shawl? That was the kind of man he was. You know, he was, he could be abrasive. People may not do, have many issues with him, but he was a gentle, concerned person. To those he cared, he had to care. He cared for my husband very much. So that was great man, great man. We don't make them like that again. Thank you, Mr. Rao. And uh, uh, I must admit that we are a little bit greedy. Uh, we are. We cannot uh, miss this opportunity to say hello to Professor CNR Rao. It is so great of him to have joined us today. Sir, if you would like to share a few thoughts with us on this special day, we will all be really blessed. Okay. Thank you. We had a national day here. We, okay. we were busy and then, uh, you know, he came just in yes. time for this. Okay. So. I think just seeing you itself is a great uh, source of inspiration for us. And thank you very much for the excellent lecture. And I'm sure the large uh, audience uh, which has joined today for the meeting, they will all remember it for a very, very long time to come. Thank you, ma'am. People will, uh, all your uh, audience being such a distinguished audience, would know all the things about his, uh, you know, as a scientist, as a superlative scientist, un unparalleled scientist, they would not know what made Faraday, what he was. So I thought I would share that with the 
Yes. I think it was very appropriate. Thank you very much. And if you agree, we will close the meeting here. And we look forward to receiving you sometime at HBNI in person yeah. to get more inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes.